right, good evening everyone. Welcome to the five o'clock hour tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask his blessing on this, and then we're going to get right into grading our quiz, uh, page number eight on financial stewardship. Heavenly Father, thank you for a wonderful day thus far. Thank you for health and strength that we can be here tonight. We do pray that you would be with anyone who's not well, that you would restore health to them and they would be able to be uh, back with us very soon. Pray for those that are on their way, maybe even yet for this hour as well as the next hour. Help us, Lord, to be um, open our eyes that we can behold wondrous things out of your law, even in this lesson time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, page number eight, lesson six quiz. Number one, who is the source of all of our resources? God is. Okay, very good, very good. Now, there were three verses in that section, you only had to list two, and then you were supposed to write out one of the verses. So you list two, write out one of the verses. Who can give us one of the verses? Maybe the one that you wrote out. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Very good, very good. So Vergiana chose Psalm 24.1. She wrote that out. Someone else, one of the other three verses that you actually, you wrote this one out so that you can read it to us. There's two more. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, that was James 1.17. Good. And then who happened to write out the other one? Do we have anybody? Okay, Miss Joy. All right, good. Haggai 2.8. So James 1.17, Haggai 2.8, Psalm 24.1. Excellent. Number two, financial rule number one states giving is a blank. Yes, ma'am. Command. Very good. Giving is a command. What is at least one of the references that tell us this? Yes, sir. Acts 20, 35, good. Anybody else have a different one? That's, what, that's the one I had. And there was, there was one other one that you could have put. Yes. Yep, Luke 6, 38, very good. And yeah, that's it, okay. Good. All right. Number three. List three ways that we can give. So we'll have three different people help us with this. Number one, it starts with a T. Who has number one? I see that hand over there. Tithe or tithe, sure. Yep, very good. Okay, the second one starts with an O. Who has the second one? Offerings. Okay, very good. And the third one is... Alms, yep, alms giving, okay? Tithes, offerings, and alms. Number four, a tithe is 10% of all of our what? Increase. Good, top of page nine, number five. Three responsibilities when tithing, okay? Number one starts with an A, blank our increase. Assess our increase, okay? Let's get somebody that hasn't answered yet for B. Blank the tithe to the house of God. Somebody that hasn't answered yet. Starts with a B. Bring the tithe to the house of God, okay? And then someone else that hasn't answered yet for letter C. Blank it to the Lord by placing it in the offering plate, using e-transfer or in the box. They're, those are all there. <laughs> Sorry, I just added that. <laughs> Jacob, commit. Very good. All right. Good. All right. Number six. An offering is, given, is giving blank 10% to show our love and gratitude to God. 
Anybody can answer this one. Beyond, right. Letter B or beyond is fine. Either one. Good. Number seven. Financial rule number three states, guard against this. Mm -hmm. Debt, right. And who has a verse that explains that principle that's listed in the notes? Proverbs 22.7. Good. 22.7. Okay, you said, okay. I heard you. That's what I heard. <laughs> okay. So, four things about debt. Number one, what do you have for that one? What does debt do? Discourages us. Good. Number two, distresses us. Number three, divides us. And number four, disqualifies us. Okay. Number nine, financial rule number four says that we should gain this. Yes, sir. Contentment. Very good. We should gain contentment. And what was one of the verses that explains that principle? Okay. There's another one as well. Okay, Hebrews 13, 5. Good. Both of those are, are correct. Top of page 10. Speaking of 1 Timothy 6, 6, and 8. Brother Kim, do you want to go ahead and read that? Since you picked it. Very good. Very good. Okay, number 10. Let your blank be your boss. It also starts with a B. Budget. And then Proverbs 27, 23. Somebody want to read that? Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Mm-hmm. Very good. Proverbs 27, 23. And then, okay, so that's the end of the quiz. That's the end of financial stewardship, at least the lesson. If you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Not, not right now. We're going to go right into the next book. And we are on book seven. Book seven. Does anybody need a copy of book seven? Judgment Seat of Christ. There we go. We have more up here, too, I think. Miss Gabriella has some more. There's another one there. Anybody else? Okay. I think everybody has one. We'll pick up the extras at the end. All right, good. Number, uh, page number two. Top of page number two. As a loving father, God wants to reward his children. There will come a day when God rewards each of us for our words, our actions, and our motives. The judgment seat of Christ will be when God reveals the full value of our works. God promises to reward us on that day for the good things we do in partnership with him today. So we believe the Bible teaches that there are two judgments. One is for those who are believers, those who are born-again believers. That is what we're talking about tonight. This is for someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. They know because of what Jesus did on the cross, how he rose from the grave, they have turned to that as their sole manner of knowing their own way to heaven is through Christ. It's not through baptism. It's not through the church. So they're saved by grace through faith. It doesn't mean that that individual, which I think is most of us, probably not all of us, but most of us, some of the younger kids, but maybe not even, maybe some older people too. Um, just because I'm saved doesn't mean I'm not going to go through a judgment. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. So this is not for unbelievers. That's a completely separate subject. And the Bible refers to that as the great white throne judgment. So this is the judgment 
for believers. So what is the judgment seat of Christ? Let's go in our Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And we'll look at a few verses here. It says in, in, our, in our booklet that, number one, the judgment seat of Christ is a day when believers give an account to God for their works. So I think um, I said this this morning, that we are not being judged for our sin. We are not being judged for our sin because That's where the cross, why the cross is so important, because that's where our sins were judged. This is not a judgment for sin that's already been taken care of. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So praise the Lord, we're never going to have to be judged for our sin. However, this is a judgment. And it's giving an account for our works. All right, Romans 14, verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans is a book written to believers. Roman Christians. But remember, all scripture is profitable for us too. We're not necessarily Roman Christians but it's profitable for us as well. So you could say that, you could circle that word all, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That all equals me. Again, God's book, the Bible, is to be taken personally. It's a book for you. It's a book for me. And so all means me. You can put that in your Bible if you want. You don't have to. You can put it in a notebook if you want. But I, I, for, I obviously believe that, that it, it's just, it is all, but it's also me. So I need to look at this in a personal way. Not that my, my wife or my dad or mom or, or if I'm even any of you, but I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, and that should affect me. I shouldn't be scared of it. In that respect, scared. I think a reverential fear should be there. But I need to get ready because I'm going to be there. Look at verse number 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12. So then every one of us, I think you could do the same thing with every one of us equals me. All equals me. Every one of us equals me. Shall give account of, what is the next word? Himself. Himself equals me. (laughs) I'm not giving an account for anybody else but me. And I'm also not going to be able to say like Adam said and Eve said and even the serpent said, God, it was the woman you gave me. God, it was the serpent. I guess the serpent really didn't have an excuse, did he? (laughs) So, no, I'm going to be giving an account to God, so all equals me, every one of us equals me, and himself equals me. So, I think it's really good that we look at this judgment seat of Christ, not necessarily as this big gathering of all of the Christians of the whole world, I think we ought to look at it as, I'm going to be there. I'm not saying no one else is going to be there. I'm just saying that a lot of times we just kind of lump ourselves in with everybody else and go with the flow. That can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. But I'm not going to give an account for you, and you're not going to give an account for me. Okay, number two, moving on. This judgment... I guess we kind of covered this, but let's go through it. This judgment does not determine my eternal destination. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 
This is what we were just talking about. 1 Peter 2, 24. Who, when he was... Excuse me. Yeah, let's read 23 as well. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self, Jesus... That's who who his own self is. Bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So we could also take that and say, by whose stripes ye were healed. Ye equals me. So the cross is personal. The judgment is personal. John 10, 28. John 10, 28. This is a verse to highlight in your Bible. This is a verse possibly for you to write out on a 3 by 5 card. You want to be familiar with this verse because there will be times that the enemy will attack us. And this is a great verse regarding eternal security. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Never perish. That's it. You might want to underline that word. Never. Once God gives you and me eternal life, we have a promise. Here's one of those promises. This morning, it was more, let's look at the promiser. He's going to take care of everything. Well, then, as we're reading, even right now, we're seeing a promise. And it's not just for the whole world, it's for you. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. They equals me. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The punishment for sin was taken care of on the cross. Praise the Lord for that. I no longer fear the judgment of my sin because Jesus took the penalty for me. We're not going to turn to it, but at the bottom of page two, you can, on your own time this week, you can see the other judgment for unbelievers is listed. Revelation 20, 11, and 12. So that's a different judgment. And that one is a judgment for sin. Because those individuals have never accepted the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so there has to be a payment for sin. What is the payment for sin? Death. So you either we either accept Jesus' death, his burial and resurrection, or our, our death will have to be what takes place. Eternally. Number three, top of page three. So what is the judgment seat of Christ? It is a day when believers give an account of their good works to God. It does not determine our eternal destination. And number three, it is a day of rewards and disappointments for believers. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. Revelation 22.12 is also listed there. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Somebody like to read that one, please? Okay, thank you. So, again, it says there, we must all appear. So all means me. And this is a time where those things that I did for Christ are going to be rewarded. And there's also, not, there's also a motive in there. I think we're going to get to that in a minute. So it is an event 
to reward believers for what we did for Christ and why we did it. That is the judgment seat of Christ. Now, how will believers be judged? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I know it's listed in there. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We have several verses here, verses 11 through 15. Verses 11 through 15. All right, who would like to read verse 11? Okay, so when we get saved, that's the foundation, right? The chief cornerstone, the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot get saved by works. We're saved through Christ and Christ alone. But that doesn't mean we stop. And so now Paul says, okay, we have a foundation. Nobody, no, nobody stops with the foundation, but you have to have it. Without the foundation, you're going to crumble. So it's vital. It's the most important. But now Paul says, okay, let's put something on it. All right, who wants to read? Who can read verse number 12? Go for it. Okay, very good. So notice what we have here. We have two sets of threes. We have two sets of threes. We have gold, silver, and precious stones. That's set number one. Those are going to stand the fire. They're going to stand the heat. That's what we want. But we, won't, we don't always build with those metals or whatever. Then we have a second set of three, and that is... Wood, hay, and stubble. We all know what will happen to them with some fire. Well, they're going to burn up and there's going to be nothing left but some ashes. The other ones, they're going to be refined and there's going to be something left. All right, someone read please verse 13. Okay, very good. So, as we just said, you and I, were at this judgment seat of Christ, and I don't know exactly how it's going to look. I don't think we have to know exactly how it's going to look. But we have a really good picture, though, of it in our mind's eye right here from the Scriptures that we come to the Lord and we've got this pile of gold, silver, precious stones, and we've got this mixed in that pile, possibly. We have wood, hay, and stubble, and it's just this big pile. And the Bible says here that every man's work shall be made manifest. That, that word means that it's going to be made known. You know, some people, some people are serving the Lord right now and nobody knows about it. They're just quietly serving the Lord. Some people are serving the Lord and they're not even here because they're confined to their homes. They're confined to uh, possibly a wheelchair and they can't get here as much or at all. That doesn't mean they, they don't have value in the service of the Lord. May we never think that either. If you were to ever be in that, if I'm never to be in that situation, may we never get to the idea that only the people that are here are serving the Lord. We know that's not true, but sometimes we have that idea in our mind. And so, But in this day, it's very clear that it's going to be made known. And it says, therefore, the day shall declare it. What day? The judgment seat of Christ. It's going to make it known. And there's going to be somehow, God's going to put this fire to it. It's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed if it was the first set of three or the second set of three. Now, verse 14. Someone read verse 14, please.
Okay, very good. So all of a sudden, this fire comes down. I don't know exactly how it's going to be, but this fire comes down on pile one and pile two, or maybe it's just one pile. The fire comes on, and it's done, and then there's a little bit left or a lot left. We want to get as much as we can to the glory of God. This isn't so we can pat ourselves on the back and say, my pile's big. That's not what this judgment is about. Because it says here in verse 14, we will receive a reward if any man's work abide. Again, if any man's work abide. So the judgment seat of Christ is a reckoning day for our works so what this tells me, and I'm, I'm going to say this, I want to say this as, as lovingly and as kindly as possible, but if I have the ability to do more than just come and sit in a seat, I need to. Because this is an opportunity, and, and if that's all I can do, fine. I'm not saying that's not important, but it's talking here, if any man's work abide which he, he, he is me, hath built thereon. Built where? The foundation. So I'm not building on wherever I want to build it. I'm building on Christ. I think that's very important. I don't just pick and choose where I, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this or I'm going to do that, and it's going to be, God's going to reward me. Well, you know, time out. If you're not building it on Christ, that's where it's got to be in first. And that's what he says here. He had built thereon. I believe that's Jesus Christ. Well, Christ is the head of the, he's the head of the church. Yeah, the head of the body, which is the church. So I think one of the first places that we want to be working and serving is the church. Because Christ is the head and Christ is the foundation. And, um, and I'm thankful for that. So, all right, let's keep going. And then, okay, but verse 15 is there too. Let's not ignore verse 15. Can somebody read verse 15, please? Yes, sir, Brother Kim. Okay, so this tells us that that fire comes down and there's nothing left. And I pray that doesn't happen to any of us in here, honestly. But it obviously can happen. There's absolutely nothing there. It's just ashes. That, that's possible, and, and it says that obviously... It's loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Galatians six four. Yeah. Yes, in himself alone, not in another. Yeah. So it's personal. But there's still as it says here, it doesn't mean you don't go to heaven. But yes, I want to be rejoicing. <laughs> I want to go in rejoicing. Yes, I'm going to go in with some regret. I don't think anybody won't. But I want to limit that. But again, remember, this judgment is not saying, okay, you have nothing to show for, you're going to hell. No. It's clearly saying here that he shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 might be on the same page. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. How will believers be judged? Number one, good works will be revealed and rewarded. Number or top of page four, God is looking for what is valuable to him. God is interested in the sincerity of our service, our Christian service. Our motivation for serving others should be to please God. 
and show our love for him. The works of God approves, the works God approves will remain. Gold, silver, and precious stone. Number two, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we just read. We just read these verses. We won't, read, we won't read them again. I think I pretty much covered all this. It is possible to lose expected awards. I think we covered that. Number four, or next question on page four. For what does God want to reward us? Number one, for serving others. Serving others. Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unrighteous, to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the who? To the saints, to fellow believers. It doesn't mean we don't help anybody else, but we're serving one another and do minister. Mark 9.41, somebody want to read that one, please? Yeah, and a cup of cold water is really welcome right now, isn't it? <laughs> Whatever we do, I think is what it's saying here, is that we want, we're not doing it in our name. We're not doing it for a reward even now. We want to we try to move beyond, you know, we've all been stung, okay? I'm not talking about bees, Somebody didn't recognize or, or, or catch us when we did something for, you know. It happens to all of us. But we want to ask the Lord to help us to mature in the faith to, to where we know that God is keeping track. God knows all of this. Top of page two, or top of page five, number two, for giving to the poor. Proverbs 19, 17, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given him, excuse me, that which he hath given, will he, God, pay him again. So it's not about giving to people that can give back to me, but it's about seeking ways to give to people that cannot give back to me. God takes care of that. There's a blessing there. Number three, for working with the Lord from the heart. I think that's so important. That's that word heart. It's not I don't, it's not I have to serve the Lord, I get to serve the Lord. Think of it. We're not talking about just uh, we're not talking obviously about our boss. We're talking about the Lord. We're not talking about the pastor. We're talking about the Lord. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Somebody want to read those, please? Boy, there's some great statements right there. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. That cup of cold water, as to the Lord. Getting somebody a bulletin, as to the Lord. Helping someone with whatever, as to the Lord. And notice he says, ye shall receive the reward of the, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward. Again, we may not receive the reward here. But there's coming a day when there will be a reward of the Lord. And again, it's not so that we can put it in our back pocket and say, we have a bunch of awards we want to honor the Lord with these. Not with eye service, Ephesians 6, 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as ser the servants of Christ, doing the will of God. Where? From the heart. We would all have to admit there are times in the week, there are times in the ministry. And, and remember, everybody's in the ministry. This isn't just pastors. Everybody, if you're saved, you're in the ministry. But there's times when we're all within the ministry, that the heart isn't in it. And we're just kind of going through the motions. 
That happens. But we don't want it to happen for extended periods of time. We want to say, Lord, forgive me for just going through the motions. I want to put my heart into this thing. I want to give my best. Again, it's not for anybody here. It's for him. It doesn't matter if anybody sees us. That's what that word eye service means. It's not if anybody pats us on the shoulder. Great job. And we need to do that. But that's not what we're after. We, we want to do the will of God from the heart. Every good thing that a believer does for God with the right motive will be rewarded. My primary motive should always be love for God. Why do we do this? Because we love God. Why do we serve? Why do we do? Why do we? Because we love God. And God alone is worthy of our labor. Number four, God rewards us for sharing the gospel. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, right there in that same passage there. 1 Corinthians 3. Somebody want to read verse 6, please. All right. So both are involved. Paul planted, Apollos watered. Verse 7. All right, and then verse 8. Okay, what is the context? The context is talking about getting the gospel out. And so, some water, some plant. We get that. Which one are you doing? The key is, be doing one of them. We don't have to worry about which one it is. In fact, we may not know which one it is. We may give a gospel tract to someone who's never had the gospel before. Well, I, I kind of think that might be planting. Would you not agree? They've never, they don't even know what the gospel is. That's not a watering. That's a planting because we've got to get the seed there. Someone comes along uh, a few months later and begins to speak to them about Christ out of the blue. That's watering. That same person. By the way, God works this way. That man that we met yesterday up on, uh, up on the mountain, Burke Mountain, I don't think that was a planting. I think that was a watering. I think that man's heard the gospel before. But we've got to be involved. One, it's either a planting or a watering. And the key is, which one are we doing? Let's, let's be involved. We don't know which one it is sometimes. But the context of this passage is that he, the Bible says in verse number nine, shall receive every man, so every man should be me. I should be one of those every man. That's mankind, not males, okay? Every mankind should be involved in planting or watering. And when that happens, you know what? We won't even know about it, possibly. But look what it says. He shall receive his own reward according to what? His own labor. We won't even know until we get to heaven. Somehow God comes, you know, this, this judgment comes, the part of the judgment comes, and, you know, so-and-so that you were, you planted the seed and then this person watered it and watered it and watered it and watered it and there were seven people involved, but John got saved. Guess what? All seven get a reward. Because that's what it says. God's the one who got the in, brought the increase, but he says, I'm going to give a reward for everyone that had a part. And we don't know where we're, 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 we're involved in that. See, I get excited about that because a lot of times we don't see anything. That shouldn't get us discouraged because we're part of the process. We're either a planter or a waterer every time we give the gospel out. Planting, watering, planting, watering. It's not up to me to bring the increase, but it is my responsibility to plant and water. 
and ask for God to bring the increase. I thank God for that, that he gives us the opportunity to be involved in the Great Commission. How about you? I mean, who are we to be ambassadors for Christ? Who are we? We're no, I'm nobody. But he calls on us to do that. Turn to Psalm 126, please. Psalm 126. Verse 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. John 4, 36. So, we're sharing the gospel. Top of page six. Quickly, three more. Number five. Rewarded for how we handled our speech. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew 12, 36. That's pretty, pretty convicting. Number six. There's a reward for how we handled trials in our life. Look what it says in 1 Peter 1.7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's a tough one, isn't it? It's difficult, but we have the Lord to help us to go through a trial and be able to, at the end of the trial, be found unto praise and honor and glory. Lord Jesus. And lastly, number seven. For how I managed what God entrusted to me. Let's turn to Luke 16.10. Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If ye therefore have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Looking at being faithful with what God has given us. Because if we are faithful in that which is least, we will be given much management. We are, we are a steward. Every Christian has been uniquely gifted by God. All of us here today. Therefore, with God's investment, each Christian is accountable for his or her resources and abilities. So you say, I wish I had more. No, that's not the right spirit. Take what you have been given. I'm not talking about your money, our money. I'm talking about what God has given you by way of, it could be that, I guess, but what God has given you to serve him with. You say, if I only had this talent. No, that's not, that, that won't work. It's taking what you already have. Maybe it's little, maybe it's medium, maybe it's large, maybe it's much. Doesn't matter. But it's taking whatever it is you have and saying, okay, I feel like I wish I could do this, but no, I'm thankful I have this. Now, God, I want to give this back to you. I want to serve you to the fullest of my ability with my one hand worth of whatever. 
Not wanting to do something else beyond who you are and how God created you. Because God created all of us to be able to do whatever it is that we can do with his power and his might. Nothing more, nothing less. And I think what happens is a lot of times we might, we might get a little bit discouraged thinking if I could only do what they do or if I could only do what he does or she does. And, and honestly, we're missing out because that's not how God created you. That's not what God created me to do, what that pastor can do. God created me to do and be an under shepherd like this. And I'm not saying I'm doing enough. I should be doing more with the Lord's help. But I don't want to get caught up in comparison because the Bible says that's not wise. When we compare ourselves among ourselves, the Bible says that we're not wise. So, live consciously aware today that there's coming a day when we will stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And that fire is going to come, and my pile is going to be what's going to be left. Remember, don't build it on yourself. Don't build it on the church. You're building it on the foundation. And Jesus is that foundation, as we learned tonight. It starts with Christ. That's why it's so important that we encourage new believers. Maybe some of you in here tonight are a new believer. You've only been saved six months or a year or whatever. Praise the Lord, you're saved. But that's not the end. That's not the end. That's only the beginning. Now it's time to start building on the foundation, building on Christ. That's when it gets really exciting. I'm not saying it's not really exciting to be on my way to heaven, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I can't earn my way to heaven, but I can take what God has given me and bring glory to God. And that ought to be the, the goal and the excitement of every believer. That we, a sinner saved by grace, have the opportunity, now that we are saved, to build on Christ with gold, with silver, and with precious stones. And limiting the wood, hay, and stubble. I know I've got a lot of that in there. But I want to limit that. And I want to get the first set of three. Anyway, let's pray.